And now I would like to introduce a very special panel discussion here today with the people that we all love. We have here <laughs> uh, Bidel Gabi. Chris Lam. Steve McIntyre. And Enrico Sini. <laughs> and on a very, very interesting topic, ignoring negativity. Well done, thank you. So good afternoon, everyone. Welcome to DevConf and to Taiwan. Uh, interesting little fact I was uh, commenting on in a panel discussion the other day. Uh, fun fact that people may not know about me, despite all of the crazy traveling I did during my years as a corporate executive, this is actually the first time I've ever visited Taiwan. It's been a lot of fun so far, so thanks to everyone for being here and for having the conference here. Um, this session is, you know, the title may seem a little bit weird. What happened is a few months ago, there was another one of those things that happens fairly routinely in Debian. Somebody posted a message on one of our mailing lists that a few of us who were chatting on IRC immediately reacted to by saying, oh my god, this is going to generate another one of those long, nasty threads that none of us like to read. And um, Steve and I, in particular, started sort of trading thoughts back and forth about, you know, how, do, how have we figured out how to not get really depressed and still be able to do productive, useful work for the project when that sort of thing happens. And somebody else who was around, it might have been Enrico even, <coughs> um, poked us and said, you know, that would make a good DevConf talk. Um, and so that's where this sort of came from. I'm really pleased that Chris and Enrico and Steve have all agreed to join me and try and convey some useful uh, learnings and experiences from uh, our personal uh, participation in Debian and the roles that we've played uh, to try and help uh, everyone else here and everybody who's watching the video stream uh, understand how it is that we can go for a very long time uh, contributing to Debian without going completely nuts. Um, but before we dive into this, out of curiosity, how many of you in the room are at your first DebConf? That's exciting. Thank you for being here. How, how many of you have been to five or more DebConfs? Ten or more? Fifteen or more? <laughs> Has anybody else been to 17 in a row? Show off. Yeah, I had to show off. That's, that's one of the few stats about me that's also probably sort of interesting here. Um, look, uh, to sort of frame things a little bit, what, what we're going to do is I'm going to provide just a tiny bit of context to sort of explain what we do and don't want to try and cover in this session. And then we're going to sort of pass the mic around, and each of these fine individuals will convey some uh, wisdom or thoughts um, in this topic area. And then after we've had a chance to do that, uh, assuming there's still time available, which I think there will be, um, we'll be happy to field questions and we'll see if we can't help in some way to make it possible for all of us to be more productive and happier contributors to Debian. So first of all, I want to make it clear that this session is not about harassment. Um, when we talk about ignoring negativity, we are absolutely not talking about tolerating actual harassment of anybody in the project. That's unreasonable and we would never go there. But there are an awful lot of actions and behaviors by individuals in the project that are frustrating or irritating to other people, but don't really rise to the level of something that would be appropriate to consider harassment. And yet, some of those things can be really depressing. So what this session is about is, you know, trying to help convey things that we think we've learned about how you can be a long-term productive contributor to a project like this where all of us who are here are intensely passionate about what we're doing. And that passion causes us to often be very outspoken and to have very strongly held opinions. And so if you're going to try and operate in this sort of environment, you have to figure out how to feel good about what it is that you're doing and the contributions you're making to the project, even if not everything going on around you is something that makes you feel good. And in fact, there may be things happening elsewhere in the project at any given moment that make you feel really bad. 
And I hope in the process that part of what comes out is that, you know, some of you at least recognize things that you've done in the past or you've seen other people do that unintentionally probably help to create a less positive, potentially more negative environment for other people around you who are trying to contribute to the project. And hopefully that sort of dose of self-awareness makes it possible for all of us to focus more of our contributions in the project on sort of being excellent to each other and making this a better environment for everybody and not bringing more negative energy into the space. So with that, I'm gonna hand off, which one of you guys would like to? Please. Ah. Chris? Please. One of you guys? Who would like to go first? Oh, that was the question, okay. Yeah. Um, sure. <laughs> okay, <laughs> Enrico. Mm. Um, hi. Um, yeah, um, I guess um, one thought I had mm, to start a conversation is um, that often it happens that at work, if you're not on top of things and y y you stop paying attention to what other people are doing, uh, chances are that, that, that they'll do something stupid, at least in, in some work environments. Whereas in Debian, if you don't pay attention to what other people are doing and, and, and you're not on top of things, chances are other people will do something smart. Uh, but uh, if I ap ap applying the same thing at work where maybe one is like in charge of technical things and so on. In Debian, kind of that, that sense of responsibility uh, turns into a compulsion of control, which uh, really doesn't help because the project is way too big. So there, there was, a, in, in a recent flame war, um, somebody pointed out, um, I can't, um, like this thing, I can't, by being a Debian developer, I don't want to be associated with this thing. And I thought, well, yeah, I don't want to be associated with my SQL, but uh, I'm still okay being a Debian developer, even if Debian ships my SQL. That breaks UTF-8. I mean, seriously, people. But um, I mean, um, it's fine. I'm only responsible for the things I maintain, and, and that's where my reputation goes. And for the rest of Debian, I let go and I live happy. But if somebody feels responsible for all of Debian, then responsibility with great powers come great responsibilities, with great responsibilities comes great control freakness. <laughs> uh, and, and then everybody has to have an opinion on everything and the project is not sustainable. So I guess quite uh, an important thing is to let go when uh, there are things that I don't understand. I'm quite happy that way, actually. There's so many things I don't understand in Debian. It's amazing. How can it boot on this thing? I mean, congratulations to whoever did that. Um, uh, probably you. Uh, Maybe. Uh, <laughs> but yeah, um, I mean, yeah. So the thing I found in the many years I've been involved in Debian that, carrying on from Enrico slightly, is trying to keep up with it all. It's not, it, you know, it's, it's the fire hose thing again that you hear people talk about, but worse. Um, back t 15 years ago, I remember trying to read most of the mailing lists. I wasn't necessarily following, I wasn't re replying to most of it, but I wanted to see what was going on. Debian was amazing and so diverse and so much good stuff was going on. And then I realized I was running out of time to sleep. And that didn't do any good for me either. It meant I wasn't actually doing the things I was trying to work on. But wow, wasn't it a great place to be? So Debian can be such an amazing project to be part of because um, there are so many really, really intelligent white people doing amazing things every day. And yet, it can also be one of the most frustrating things, one of the most frustrating places to be um, when you think that, oh, I'm, I'm holding people up or there are things I'm not doing that I should be doing and, and oh, I, I feel bad. Um, my own involvement has been very cyclical over the years. There are times when it's on and up 
and I can be spending, I'll be honest, of course I can talk about this honestly because I don't work for those people anymore, but I spent more time doing Debian work than doing paid work for, for a number of the years I've been around. And I felt amazing for it. I felt really, really rewarded. It's been great fun. There's been lots of achievements. Sometimes there are days when I'm just not in the mood. I can't, I can't cope with it. You know, I've got other things to do. You know, family matters come up. I'm just generally just feeling grouchy. Those are the days when it's much harder. Those are the days when it, it, it is an important thing to recognize that I'm not necessarily going to achieve much directly. Don't get down about it. You know, move on, take the day off, take, take a week off, a month off, it's fine. You know, the world will move on, the world will carry on. The only thing that really I, you know, and I've, I've said this a number of times to lots of people over, over the years is, um, be prepared to back away, be prepared to be honest. The worst one is when you beat yourself up because you can't, because, you know, you can't admit to yourself you feel ashamed to admit that you're struggling. Um, there are lots of people around. People will pick, up, will pick up after you. People will help. People will understand. After all, we're all human. Thanks, Steve. Um, just to scroll back to um, your outline of what this talk is, isn't, isn't about, it reminds me a lot of a um, categorization of different types of conversation in terms of um, you have agreeable conversation, perhaps like the one we're having now. And then you have unacceptable um, tone of conversation, which again is not within the remit. And then there's the disagreeable, which is the hard, the hard category, because the the agreeable is easy, because whatever, who cares? Um, and the unacceptable is just unacceptable, and harassment would obviously come underneath that. And it is this m middle category of mm, um, that sort of yeah. So I thought that was quite a good when I read that first. It was quite a good framing for what for putting conversations into, and for when you are looking at a conversation, um, being able to categorize it like such is, can be quite useful. Um, I certainly don't have any, um, I certainly don't have the experience of, um, in terms of time, uh, um, as, as these fine gentlemen, with <laughs> Debian and experiencing negativity there. But perhaps some of it has been a bit more, as DPL anyway, has come a bit more privately than on the mailing lists. Um, and that's underlined how audience matters. So that speaks to words like face and respect and things like that. Because a mail sent, uh, a nasty mail sent privately does different things and pushes different buttons than one sent publicly. Um, I'm not gonna say one is worse than the other because you can probably imagine that one, you know, I make it up or exaggerating for effect, but slandering you publicly is one thing but one that is quite nasty and sent to you directly, it's clearly designed to needle you directly, is, is also unpleasant in its own, its own way. But I have no, no answers here. I mean, um, keeping perspective has been quite important and educating myself about human, fa um, human brain uh, problems and fail, failties, whatever they're called from the term. Um, but knowing that, for example, if you receive 100 bits of positive feedback, <laughs> you wish, but say one did receive 100 bits of positive feedback in Debian and then got one negative one, guess what you're going to try and fall asleep to whilst thinking about it? It's going to be the negative one. Um, and it's going to be in your head all day whilst in the shower and you're going to be... And there's a whole class of these um, just sort of foibles, that's the word, foibles in our, um, in our sort of fallen homo sapien post-lapsarian brains that mean that you do focus on all these negative, um, negative things. And so to, to also not to ruminate on them, as, and as Sledge already said, sometimes just step away for that five minutes, five hours, five days, five weeks. That is, that is absolutely fine. That actually sort of ties in well to one of the things I wanted to talk about, which is that you know, our primary means of communicating with each other in the Debian project is through email. I mean, we use other things too, IRC and so forth, but, and certainly face-to-face -face communications at events like DevConf. But because so much of our communication with each other is via email, um, it's very easy for people to sort of lose track of the way email really ought to work. 
And what I mean by that is I've always thought that the email process was meant to be read, contemplate, then write. And unfortunately, when emotions start to crank up, you know, people rush through that first stage, skip over the second one entirely, and spend most of the time in the third. And when that happens, it's really, really easy for the energy being applied, positively or negatively, to a discussion to escalate really rapidly. And I've discovered, you know, myself that um, if I'm really irritated and there's something I really feel compelled to say, that there's immense value in dumping it all out of my brain into a buffer, you know, <clears throat> edit buffer or something, and then not hitting send, but going away and doing something completely different for a while, as you say, detaching a bit, and then come back and see whether I still feel as passionately about that. Sometimes I really do, but I realize that I could take about three quarters of the words out of the message and still convey the one thing that I really believe that would be a useful addition to the conversation. And if you're willing and able to take the time to do that, um, all of a sudden, you know, it becomes much easier to do these things we talk about sometimes of trying to keep the conversation focused on the actual technical content instead of the personalities of the people involved and things like that. And this goes a really long way towards making it easier to feel good about contributing to the project. I also thought about a couple of other things. Um, because the Debian project is really all about this notion that we've made common cause to create a free operating system. Um, if you are working to make some sort of improvement or contribution to the operating system, the most frustrating thing that can happen sometimes is when there's something that sort of blocks your ability to make progress. And sometimes, as, as Steve said, that's, you know, <clears throat> you've just got other things going on in your life and you lose enthusiasm for a while. That's totally okay, and when that happens, you ought to back away. But it's really good if you let other people around you in the project know that you're doing that. Mm. Um, I sometimes chuckle at the number of random vacation messages that show up on places like Debian Private, and it's kind of like, why do I care that that person's going to have a nice vacation on the south of France or something? But the flip side of that is that if you do let the other people that you work with in the project know when stuff is going on in your life so that they're not just getting frustrated and wondering why you're not responding or they feel empowered to go do something in your absence, then that can help keep from sort of blocking people's ability to do things. I also observed last year um, in the session that, um, where I talked about some of the history of the project at the DebCon from Montreal, um, that in the early days of this project, this concept of ownership of packages was not quite as ingrained as it is today. In fact, it wasn't until at least a year, a year and a half after I joined Debian that the whole notion that there was an assigned responsible individual for a given package got coded into our bug tracking and packaging systems. And that causes me sometimes to think about, you know, what's going on when I see people arguing in a thread in the bug tracking system about, you know, yes, I'll do this, no, I won't. And it particularly causes me to think when you know somebody has disappeared for a while and other people have something that's you know blocking a transition or whatever that they'd really like to get taken care of and they're really concerned about doing a non-maintainer upload and the whole reason we have processes to do things like that is to be able to tolerate this situation where not everybody who's a passionate volunteer can be around you know seven days a week 24 hours a day to to make progress on things so I don't know if there's any, any of those really particularly help. I, I have to also echo Steve's observation that about 15 years ago, specifically the year that I was Debian project leader, um, I did subscribe to, at the time, all 89 of Debian's mailing lists, and I read every message and every one of them every day. And I have to admit that there were days when that left me with absolutely zero energy to do anything productive for the project. And so, like many people, I have completely ratcheted down how many such things I try to pay attention to on an average day. But I'm very, very quick when somebody makes a reference in an IRC channel or drops me an email asking my opinion about something to dive in and go read, you know, even the long, nasty email threads because sometimes, you know, it's necessary to understand what's going on and be able to, to help and make progress. 
But I have discovered that if I manage to sort of put the blinders on a little bit and think about the thing that I actually want to get done today, and sometimes to actually sit down and fix the bug before I go dive in and read a bunch of mailing list traffic, uh, you'd be surprised how much more productive work you can get done you know, before the whole craziness sets in. Um, yeah, the, when you mentioned um, uh, the mails and reviewing and so on, you reminded me of a suggestion Mako gave me. That was when you w w write a mail, you, you, you write a long explanation for everything and, and have your point at the bottom. And at that point, take the main, the, w your, what you wanted to say from the bottom and put it at the top and then delete everything else. Uh, because that, that, by the way, is a really good w good thing to do also when you're working in big corporations if you're trying to convince your boss of something, because they generally can't read more than three lines of an email before they move on to the next thing. Right. And, and fair enough, they probably won't have the time, uh, in, because th they need to read Gazillion. Um, and, and in a way, that means that your thought process maybe it's less interesting, or I don't know, but then the thought process kind of um, hides the point. And, it may, and sometimes I would feel in doing that that I kind of failed to make a convincing argument because I didn't set the sort of the, all the discourse that leads to that. And, and it's also that, I think, a bit of a control freakery. So, I mean, I'm not actually... Uh, I don't have the power to control the thoughts of the people reading the email. So in the end, it's the point I'm trying to make that may resonate with the thought process I had or somebody else's thought process. Um, but there's something like w when I send an email to a Debian mailing list, I mean, no pressure, right? It's only going to be read by thousands of people and archived by Google forever. <laughs> um, so somehow my reputation is linked to it, and there's people with extremely high reputations writing in those lists. So yeah, I mean, fine, just click send. Um, but I really am trying to force myself to say, I don't know this thing, uh, and it's okay. There's an illusion of perfection because there's so much uh, perfection going on in Debian, like technical, ex I, I, but perfection doesn't exist and Debian is not perfect. But there's a lot of technical excellency and extremely knowledgeable people hanging around in Debian. Um, so yeah, um, it's totally okay to get something wrong. Uh, it's totally okay to not know something. It's totally okay to write saying, hey, you changed my mind. You made a good point. That doesn't, it feels like a loss of control. It feels like you are not the, smartest, per the smartest person in the room. It feels like um, people will read that message 10 years later and won't hire you for the job. But actually, it, what it really feels like is that you are a human being who is able to think, uh, which is probably something positive for, for the reputation. But uh, I think there's no narrative for that in Debian. It doesn't happen usually. And so the examples that are set are sort of um, not leading in that way. But I would totally like to see more of that. Sure. So it's very difficult to see for some people the fact that, you know, we produce a technically excellent operating system. Yet, if you look behind the scenes, you see all the rubbish that goes on. You see people's mistakes. We air all of our dirty laundry all the time, and sometimes that can get people down. But fundamentally, and, uh, and I've, I've made this argument to friends a few times over the years, Debian produces an operating system almost, almost as a byproduct. Um, we happen to be an incredibly large family of great people. You know, it's a project about the people first and foremost. You know, if individuals are not cared about, if we don't help each other, support each other, the operating system doesn't happen. This ties into another thing that I've thought about before, which is that um, I, I remember being interviewed uh, the year that uh, LinuxConf Australia was first held in Hobart, and at that particular time, I found myself as the chairman of the technical committee also temporarily serving as the project secretary um, because of an abandonment of that role. And um, 
a reporter interviewed me and he asked a bunch of questions about sort of how are we coping with this huge discussion. There was a GR at the time about whether we could or could not release with binary kernel firmware blobs in the distro. And, and I sort of spontaneously commented on the fact that I thought you had to be careful to distinguish between the vocal minority and the non-vocal majority in a community as large as Debian. And I've thought about that a bunch of times since because, you know, we get sometimes really uh, voluminous threads of discussion, but if you stop and look at it, it's often the case that it's a really small percentage of the people in the project that are contributing to any one of these particular discussions. And that makes perfect sense because we cover so much technical landscape at this point that it would be highly unlikely that any of us, you know, had relevant opinions on all of it all the time. But, I of, certainly, but of course we'll profess those opinions. Yeah, and, and, and I think the point that I'm trying to make is sometimes if you sort of wake up and go read, you know, a thread or two on Devel and you sort of go, oh my God, everybody's going crazy, you have to stop and remember that it's like everybody who thought it was important to spend their personal time today adding negative energy to that particular thread may have gone crazy. But that says nothing about the 90-some percent of the rest of the project that we're quietly working on fixing something and uploading you know, a new version of a package while that discussion was going on. And you know, that doesn't necessarily provide any sort of suggestion about how to make the discussions cleaner or easier or more fun to read. But I've certainly personally found it invigorating to realize that, oh, okay, yeah, you know, a quick check on IRC of a few people the, whose opinions I respect and I realize that, oh, we haven't all gone insane all at once. There's just this voluminous thread going on and at some point I'll decide if I'm willing to choke that whole thing down and, and see if there's something I can add to the discussion. But in the meantime, I'm going to go you know, upload gzip 1.9 because I just realized how long it's been that it's out and I hadn't uploaded it. So, you know, there, I, in other words, I think it's really important sometimes to realize um, how many people actually are sort of around the project doing good stuff every day, even when we're sort of in the middle of some of our nastiest discussions. Um, there, is, oh. there is slightly a tyranny of the spare time as well involved in that, in that if you do have the time to contribute to one of those long lists multiple times, then your voice, your opinions are sort of somehow weighted, amplified, amplified weighted a little bit more, yeah. Um, I did. I did like Enrico's remark about um, uh, you, you know not always pretending that you know everything and things like that. Mm. And there are a number of com I think perhaps slightly newer areas of Debian where um, not knowing everything is just considered absolutely fine. For example, um, explicitly the Debian TIL um, IRC room is just full of people saying I didn't know this, and it's even in the topic saying, um, it says, you know, there's absolutely no judgment, you know, someone coming in saying, I didn't know GZIP existed. And it like, doesn't matter, like, and it's great. Um, it's not only great that they've now learned that, probably 10 other people on the channel have now learned that GZIP exists, and they didn't want to say before, perhaps. Um, but also, it just moves the needle in that area of just, like, it's fine to not know something or to not have this perfection, this... Um, this, this drive for uh, this outside uh, image or having that kind of thing like that, yeah. Yeah, so do, do you want to add something else, Enrico? Uh, yeah, Debian TIL is a great place to be joined it, seriously. So, so today I learned there was a Debian TIL. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> That's your first contribution. <laughs> um, TIL means today I learned. Um, and mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. and, um, about yeah, in, in, about ignoring negativity. Um, so somebody is making a point in a thread, in a, with a mail that is extremely offensive, and it takes a lot of strength to throw away the extremely offensive bit and just get to the point. Or occasionally, some people are replying into a thread just being offensive because they think it's fun and they are people that are like that. And I'm sorry for them, they're having a really bad life, but uh, we have a bunch and sometimes they contribute to threats. Um, so there's two things 
in my mind when I follow a thread. One is I'm interested in, in the technical aspect of it, and the other is there's some behavior that I consider unacceptable. And it may make sense to stick to the technical aspect, which means ignoring a lot of the red flags that are going up in my head, or you know, not taking offense, or realizing that the other person is childish and letting that go, and maybe one day they'll grow up. Um, but it's also costs, and ignoring negativity doesn't make negativity go away. Uh, the space is still not a safe and pleasant space to work on. Um, but that is an orthogonal issue. So I can bring on the technical conversation and drop the troll, drop the nasty remark, drop somebody who's trying to be mm, abusive in a way or another and stick to the main point. Um, and then take, deal with the negative part in some other way. If somebody made you uh, uncomfortable, point it out to anti-harassment, uh, talk, talk about it to a friend, go on an IRC channel of friends and say, is it just me or that thing was not acceptable? Uh, there's other ways of dealing with the negative part of a conversation and Unfortunately, dealing with, de with them both in the reply doesn't help because it, 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 the thread doesn't continue it, 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 the thread doesn't continue in, in a constructive technical way and it doesn't solve the uh, social issue because that person suddenly got all the energy they were trying to get, all the attention they were trying to get. Um, so separate the two things, keep to the technical thing if the technical thing is still interesting in the thread, drop the thread if, if the technical thing is not interesting or if there's no technical thing anymore, deal with this, the discomfort that has been caused by people in some other way. Uh, anti harassment is the first thing that comes on top of my mind. Several people may leader, uh, <laughs> uh, which uh, is the fallback for things. Maybe it would make sense to set something up that because negativity is not harassment, but pointing out that something is made me uncomfortable is something that would be nice to be able to do. And I do it with groups of friends because I have friends, people who don't, and we need a fallback. We can talk about that. Um, but yeah, separate the two things, and both things are worth to be dealt with. Dealt with. But this is, I mean, currently we are talking about how to interact constructively in a space that is not safe. How to make that space safe is something desirable, but for another time. Enrico, can I ask your advice a bit more detail on, say when you do look at the thread and analyze it a bit more objectively and upon doing that and you remove all the emotional bits there is no technical thing left you said very quickly and perhaps too easily oh you can just ignore the thread in a sense but you probably know from experience your brain can't ignore the thread right right what do you do i mean you let's say i won't write on it yes. ignore in that sense yeah. not write on it and then um maybe talk with people in private, uh, for example, is a thing that I would do. So like, of course. Uh, that, uh, it's like um, there's a nasty, ca nasty car accident uh, down in, in front of the window of your house, and there's already like people that are sort of dealing with it, but there's this morbid thing of looking at what, how it evolves. Uh, and, and it, sometimes there's threads that are a bit like that. Um, that can it get any worse? Oh wow, it did! <laughs> Congratulations. Um, uh, I guess uh, irony also works. I don't know. Sure. But sometimes it's emotionally tough. And talking with someone, uh, definitely not being alone is point one on anything. Mm -hmm. And if if we are not able in Debian to to, to to give infrastructure so that people are not alone, uh, it's something that needs improvement. 
I have to say I was rather impressed in Saturday's presentation and discussion by uh, Minister Tang about how uh, some of the tools that are being used for collaboration and developing consensus here in Taiwan, and in particular the... Hmm? Miss Tang. Miss Tang, I'm sorry. Um, yes, yeah, the problem with knowing people for a really long time, or knowing of people for a really long time. The interesting situation is the, the, the thing that I took out of that that was really interesting is this notion of uh, a mechanism for sort of voting support or lack of support for an assertion without an ability to reply to the assertion directly. If you didn't like that assertion, go make some other assertion. And over time, we build the cluster of assertions that the majority of people seem to agree to. I thought that concept was really intriguing, and I, I wondered immediately, is there some way that we could apply that you know, sort of approach and technology in Debian? And I will freely admit that that's totally beyond sort of my abilities. I don't do that kind of web software and so forth. But I looked at it and I went, wow, that's a cool idea. Switch to top coding. <sighs> <laughs> So <coughs> yeah. be, before the argument starts, so one of the things about ignoring negativity is also there is a responsibility on you to not spread negativity. So that is the, you're in a technical thread, there is something offensive. Please, if you can hold back from responding to it, then that doesn't then spread that negativity and potentially the negativity in your response to even more people. It then doesn't take up more time of more other, other people. By all means, go off and find your private space, or, you know, your space with a small number of friends, um, and go and rant there, but that is not then spreading it back to everybody. It's not making the problem worse. Obviously, it's hard. You know, we've all had the point where you've got to respond to, oh my god, this person's an idiot. I've got to tell them they're an idiot. But fundamentally, that doesn't help anybody in the long run. You know, explaining to people in a less charged way how you, th you might disagree with their opinion and this might be a better way forward is great. But diving in and you know, the ballooning threads that we get with flames, you know, we've all seen those. Fundamentally, very little actually positive comes out. So if you can't say something positive, I know it, it's a cliche, if you can't say something good, don't say anything. There it, but there is a huge value to that, especially when the continuing conversation is only spiraling downwards. Yeah, Marshall Rosenberg, who inventor of nonviolent communication, makes an example mm -hmm. of what you go to someone and say, you are an idiot. And it's quite unlikely that they'll go, thank you, sir. Uh, I realize the error of my way. I'm glad you <laughs> pointed it out to me. Uh, yeah, uh, that just puts people in the defensive. And yeah. It is true that when you finally get through my thick brain, something that I've been getting wrong for a long time, my usual response is, oh yeah, I'm an idiot. So, you know, whatever. We all have our ways of responding yeah. to things. One, um, one thing that can definitely help is to be that person that can be complained at. Be the person mm. that someone can um, seems to come to and rant and gripe at. And understand where they're coming from when they, when they are complaining, as in don't necessarily literally address their complaints or jump on the thread for them, um, because that's not really what they need right now. But they need a sympathetic person. Exactly, yeah. And, and just to say, I see where you're coming from, yeah, that is, yeah. And you perhaps don't know the context and, um, and things like that, so just being there for other people can be one definite concrete thing you can do. I've certainly also had the experience when some of these things were going on and somebody did come to me and say, hey, do you know this person? What the heck is this all about? You know, should I be really concerned about this? Um, you know, one of the roles that I've been very conscious of playing sometimes is helping to make a connection. Um, I don't actually know that person, but I know somebody that probably knows them. Maybe you want to go talk to them instead. And sometimes um, it's been interesting how often something really strange happened, um, particularly when somebody all of a sudden was like completely out of character, and I found out later that it's because something really unfortunate or horrific had happened in their life outside of Debian, and you know, we don't expect everybody to be open and sharing about all the things going on in their lives all the time. That's completely unreasonable in this kind of a project, but 
um, it kind of goes back to the thing we were talking about earlier. If you feel the need to pull away a little bit from time to time, uh, helping other people who are your friends or, or colleagues in the project know that that's happening can sometimes really defuse these sort of frustrating moments. Sure. Yeah. Um, can I? Yeah. Uh, there is a psychological state called arousal that is not what's usually uh, used for the word arousal. And it's, um, there's a Wikipedia page which is kind of interesting. It's um, maybe the opposite of boredom, according to a graph in here. Like, you're very, very much the opposite of bored. You're like, <laughs> there. Uh, and like adrenaline pumping sort of um, life or death situation. Like, I really need to act no matter what. And in that case, it's like tunnel vision, lose the context. Um, it's kind of important to r recognize when that is going on and realize that tunnel vision is happening, that you are losing context, and, and wind down for that. So in that situation, it's, it really is okay to write down a lot of things, but not send, because you are missing something. Uh, even just the tone, or what the other person really wanted to say, because it got triggered by the way the other person was saying something. So recognize that the, 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 you're breathing faster, your heartbeat is faster, you, you, you are in a hurry, your reputation depends on it. All this is, is a specific psychological state that is generally unhelpful unless you need to run away from tigers, um, which is not something we do generally in, in modern society, but the, 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 the wiring is still there. Um, so. Uh, write down all you have in mind because you are extremely productive at that point but maybe not on the point uh, and then wind down go I, I work from home i go fold the laundry it's fantastic and um <laughs> and then go back to what you've written realize you've been an idiot but there were some points that could be salvaged throw it away rewrite it in a productive it, way it's be very rare that you ever need to send that email right now you know who how does that ever matter it will wait until tomorrow when you're calmer, when you're clearer, when you can actually make a reasonable point. Unless a really tough play more is going on, that and th tomorrow there's like 30 more mails that raise wow. your arousal. In that case, I tend to like postpone until people stopped writing. Sure. And That's a good time to find something other than Debian to work on for a few mm -hmm. days in my personal experience. Yeah. You know, I, and I think it, for all of us, it's going to be different, right? We all have sort of different amounts of tolerance for noise in our lives, things that are going on around us that aren't really making us happy or providing that positive feedback that causes us to be encouraged to want to keep engaged in the things that we're working on or the people that we're working with. Um, but I, and, and I suspect it's obvious to all of you and everyone who watches the video of this in the future that none of us are you know, highly qualified experts in some of these areas, but I do hope uh, that our attempt to convey some of our experiences and some of the things that we've learned as best practices uh, for personally coping with some of these things and helping our friends and colleagues in the project um, be able to be positive and productive and engaged has been helpful or useful to all of you. Uh, with that, we're essentially out of time, and so I think rather than trying to open up for questions in the last less than a minute, I'll just thank you all very much for your attendance and for your attention this afternoon, and we'll look forward to talking to all of you in the hallways through the rest of the week. Thanks much.